Ever see a topic pop up in discussion online and it just spins off so wildly you can't help but feel the need to speak on it? Yes? No? Well, either way, that's what I'm doing here. If you've been perusing gaming social media circles the past week and change, particularly Twitter, you'll have seen a major rise in the speculation around the Switch 2, and it makes sense as to why. The OG Nintendo Switch turns 7 in less than 2 months, which by most metrics means the console's life is coming to a close, and soon we'll be preparing for the successor. As a result, plenty of rampant rumors have sprung up across the internet. Whether legit or total bullshit, we have no idea. Most claiming to know the Switch 2's battery life, RAM, internal storage, release date, internal components, the works. Again, whether any of these are actually true, we won't know until Nintendo themselves reveal it. But all of these interweaving rumors and leaks have culminated in one prevailing consensus, and it's that the Switch 2 will be about as powerful as the PlayStation 4. And of course, when that little nugget got planted in everyone's heads, the Twitter space absolutely ran away with it. That console's 10 years old! How is Nintendo so incapable of standards? This will never compete with the modern systems. And it was that last point in particular that really got me thinking. The idea that because the Switch 2 will be noticeably weaker than the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X, it won't be able to compare and thus will flop. Never mind how much this ignores the history of console success and how power often has very little to do with dominating the market, never mind the fact the Switch 1 was already an underpowered system in its own right and went on to become the best-selling video game system of the past 15 to 20 years, but biggest of all, never mind the fact that the Switch 2 just needs to have a decent game lineup within its first one or two years of its life, and it will already be on solid ground compared to its contemporaries. Because in truth, despite the past couple minutes saying otherwise, this video is not about the Switch 2. We don't have enough concrete information on it, and I don't think it's worth delving deeper into it until we have some. But rather, it's about the consoles the system will be competing with on the market. And how even despite its likely weaker status, I believe it will have no issue staking claim in the gaming landscape. Because it ain't that hard when the rest of that landscape is a barren fucking wasteland. Now I do want to preface right off the bat as a larger collective whole, the ninth generation has been far from a failure or even truly a disappointment. I know many are going to label me a fanboy for making this video and thus should make it clear this video isn't meant to just blindly rip on PlayStation and Xbox. This is more me getting a lot of gripes I've had with this specific generation off my chest and how poorly I believe it's been laid out. When looked at as an entire front, there have been some very damn good titles these past three years and change during the ninth generation's earlier days. God of War Ragnarok, Tales of Arise, Hi-Fi Rush, Resident Evil 4, Scarlet Nexus, Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart, Alan Wake 2, Lies of P, Armored Core 6, Elden Ring… There's been no lack of high quality titles to play overall. However, that's when you're talking about the entire gaming atmosphere as a complete unit. When you boil it down to the individual consoles of this generation and what they have to offer a value towards themselves specifically, good luck rummaging through those scraps. I can make this work. The ninth generation has become synonymous with two things, having legitimately impressive load times that make them near non-existent, and having exclusive libraries that are just as non-existent. You don't have to look far to see how many jokes there are thrown around about these consoles' exclusive lineups. PS5 has no games has existed as a meme for multiple years now and doesn't appear to be slowing down. And Xbox? They don't even get the privilege of having a joke because barely anyone even expected anything out of them. Now, console exclusives as a topic have become admittedly divisive in recent years. Many have begun to argue that they're anti-consumer and it's best for everyone if all games were made available everywhere. While that is true in a sense, it doesn't take into account the whole picture. Here's the thing. If all games were made available everywhere, there'd be no point in having three different boxes to play them on, plus the PC. Why have multiple consoles when there's no justifiable reason to own them on the aspect of their games? The fact is, console exclusives are what define each system, generation, and era of gaming at the time. SNES vs. Genesis had their biggest titles pitted against each other constantly, the PS1 took advantage over the N64 by having most third-party games be exclusive to it, and the PS4 all but dominated the Xbox One not just because of the latter's horrendous start, but because it had practically no worthwhile experiences of its own while the former had plenty. But now, just one generation removed from that dominance by exclusives, it feels as though neither side has learned anything or capitalized from it. 
Some people seem to get upset when you say the PS5 has no games, but if you're talking exclusives, it is not an exaggeration, at least as of right now. The Wikipedia article on this console is damning listing off its exclusives. There are 12 pure exclusives for the PlayStation 5. 12 of them. One of which being a pack and tech demo, another being a remake, two being VR, and five not even having actually released at the time of this video. I can fit the entirety of this list in a single screenshot from my iPhone. Bear in mind, we are over three years into this generation's life cycle, and console gens usually last around seven to eight years. We're fast approaching the 50% mark of this console and barely have enough exclusives in it to justify two worthwhile calendar years. Even if you bring on games that have been ported to the PC like Ratchet and Returnal that boosts the games list by, what, three at most? It's insane to me how a company whose exclusives massively launched them over their competition last gen can barely get any out to save their lives. Although not sure if that's better or worse than a company who had their mistakes in that department laid bare and still didn't learn from them. Xbox, what are you doing? What's the big fucking deal? What the fuck are we doing out here? I asked you, what and the fuck are we doing here? You heard for the entirety of the X-Bone that your games lineup was not up to standard and was the primary reason the PS4 whipped your ass, only to completely continue this asinine trend. The PS5 may be the primary target of the no games joke, but that's only because it's worth joking about, and it at least has a scrap here and there like Spider-Man 2. The Series X and S, so little was expected of them and they've arguably still underperformed. Again, this console's fourth year is now underway, and what does it have to show for it? Every game that was hyped up as a big deal for them is either still not out or has come up shockingly short. Halo Infinite had a very strong early push and people really enjoyed the campaign. Until they massively bungled the roadmap of multiplayer and people left in droves. Starfield had some notably positive reception right out of the gate. Until people really noticed Bethesda's antiquated design and opinions of that game continued to dip by the month. And Redfall? The less said, the better. I'll give them that they do have some games on the horizon that look promising. The Indiana Jones game is certainly intriguing, and I honestly think the more we see of Avowed, the more that's going to be one of the most unsung hits of the generation. But it should not be taking near four fucking years for us to finally get some titles that make these systems feel worth the cash. It's been made all the worse by just how much the cross-generation window has extended this go-around. Here's the thing about cross-gen titles. On the one hand, it is very consumer-friendly. It allows less immediately fortunate gamers to keep up with the current releases without having to rush to buy the next piece of hardware. However, the trade-off is that it ultimately takes value away from the new hardware because what's the point of upgrading when you could still play these games on the old system? Which that point has only been further exacerbated by how little graphics and technology have advanced with each passing of the torch. Thus, several games which could have been a big boost for the new consoles like God of War Ragnarok and Horizon Forbidden West have that big exclusivity trump card slip through their hands. I will admit that points more up to your own interpretation on what you value, but in a generation that's starving for notable system sellers, it only further drives the issue home, at least in my opinion. All of this would be bad enough as is, but what makes it feel all the more baffling is that this desolate wasteland is coming off the heels of a system that showed just how impactful a consistent release schedule is. Take a look back at the Switch's first year. It's widely considered one of the greatest first years a video game console has ever had. This is not only because it had system-defining bangers within the first 12 months like Breath of the Wild and Mario Odyssey, but also because of one main thing. Consistency. The Switch has been one of the most consistent consoles to grace the market, with practically every year of its life dropping at minimum three to four notable exclusives that will add value to the system and drive up reasons to own one. And I'm of the firm belief that this is one of the key contributors as to why the system has done so well. The hybrid gimmick and overall quality of the games has certainly played a factor, but the consistency of releases is one of the most underappreciated aspects of the success of the Switch. Hell, just compare the Switch to its predecessor. The Wii U's calendar was so dry every year it could be mistaken for a pile of sawdust. 
What was the point of owning one if you could barely even count on a notable game to justify buying it? Which may end up being said for these current consoles when all is said and done. Yes, they are selling very well, but how much does that have to do with their actual quality and more with gaming as a hobby just becoming more widespread with each passing year? If they don't turn it around, what will the legacy of these systems be? Because right now it feels like it'll be two powerful bricks that barely had a thing of note to call their own. Why should I believe the one company who has shown they understand the importance of release consistency couldn't keep up with these two? I genuinely would not be shocked if the Switch 2 has a more complete library by its second year than the PS5 and Series X will have by their fourth or fifth. There are still a good few years for them to turn their libraries around, and both do have promising works in the pipeline, but the sooner they get it in our hands, the better. I want to be wrong about this. I would be overjoyed if this video ages poorly three to four years from now, and both of these consoles have stunning exclusive libraries that have people overjoyed about them. But right now, given that we're past the three-year mark with these systems, they do not have the library that they should have by this point. Again, if you want a comparison, if you were to pit the timelines of these systems together, by this point in its life cycle with the Switch, we would have been past Animal Crossing New Horizons right now, which anybody who knows that system's lineup, we had a boatload by that point. Can't be said for the other two. Again, I want them to turn this around but I hope they do so sooner rather than later. I'd rather not finally feel like I got my money's worth from my PS5 when the PS6 is just around the corner. Let's pick it up, you two. Clock's ticking.